Well, welcome to this first session of the 54th Synod of the Diocese of Melbourne. We meet in the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Some who are joining online tonight will also be joining from Wurundjeri land, while others from the lands of the traditional owners of their particular locality. And let us together respect the continuing connection and custodianship for land and water that these people have. We give thanks for their ancestral knowledge and thank God for the ongoing right and responsibility of elders to care for this country. And let us commit ourselves to work and pray towards a more just settlement for all Indigenous people and pay our respects to First Nations people amongst us. We come together here at St Paul's Cathedral and online to carry out important work in the life of the Church in this diocese. This is the first session of the 54th Synod of the Diocese of Melbourne. Just as we are called together, so we've come to form a holy community from amongst the people of God over the days and then years of this 54th Synod. You have an important responsibility for the corporate leadership of the church in this diocese. Synod comes from a Greek word, synodia, meaning those who journey together. This word's used in Luke 2, verse 44, when Joseph and Mary think that Jesus is with the synodia, or group of travelers traveling home from Jerusalem. We are a group of travelers over these days. We travel with each other and with Jesus as we consider the important things that are before us in the life of the church and the world. Just like a group of travelers, we need to travel in the right direction and with the right spirit towards our journey and with each other. And you might think it's a strange thing to talk about a time when we're mostly sitting down together as a journey, but we'll use our agenda like a roadmap as we all aim to get somewhere as a result of our discussions. We need to look towards the Lord and trust each other so we can travel together in the same way. I recognize that you all make a big commitment to be present and participate in a meeting of Synod. For those who are new, I hope the induction material and pre-Synod seminars assisted your preparation. The Synod receives many reports that give an annual account of the different facets of work and ministry in the Diocese of Melbourne, as well as background material to the legislation and motions that are being brought to the Synod. The first session of a synod also involves the election of the people who will make up our governance bodies for the three-year period of the synod. The fourth day of this synod is also the Saturday of the referendum on the First Nations voice to Parliament. However, the Australian electorate responds to this question, there is certain to be much analysis of voting trends across the nation. All of the early indications ahead of the referendum suggested that Victoria was one of the most likely states to support the yes vote. More recent polling seems to cast doubt on these early figures. How strong this support is and how consistent it is across the different parts of the state will be important information. If it proves to be decided in favor of yes or not, we need to be a better and more accountable society where First Nations people can flourish. Recent discussions about the referendum should also encourage us to have a bigger vision for ministry by and amongst First Nations people across this state. The best efforts of developing this vision nationally inevitably run up against the barrier of limited resources at the General Synod level. The reports of NATSIAC, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Council, to the General Synod make this point clear. The Aboriginal Council Anglican Province of Victoria, that first met in 2018, has called for autonomy in decision making and confidence that plans can be properly resourced. We have the example of the three Tikanga model of the Church of Aotearoa, New Zealand and Polynesia which has achieved an autonomy of Maori ministry within the fellowship of their national church. 
This has happened progressively since the ordination of the first Māori priest in 1928, the commencement of a Māori General Synod representation in 1978, and then equal partnership in the three Tikanga Church since 1992. Australia has had some parallels of this journey, starting with a significant year, 1925. That year saw the ordination to the diaconate of James Noble in Perth, and the ordination to the priesthood of Joseph Louis and Poi Passi on Thursday Island. St. Paul's Theological College was established on Moa Island in Torres Strait in 1917, and Nungalinya College in Darwin in 1973. The National Aboriginal Anglican Council commenced in 1991 and became established by a canon of the General Synod in 1998, the Torres Strait Islanders having been included two years earlier. Apart from a contribution this diocese made to establish an endowment for the work of Natsiak and the National Bishops, there is no dedicated funding at the General Synod level for this work. The bishops of Victoria have considered a proposal to work with Natsiak in the province of Victoria. It's important that we approach new possibilities on a Victoria-wide basis, since this was the extent of the Diocese of Melbourne when first founded in 1847, and was the diocese and jurisdiction during the period of the greatest displacement of Aboriginal people during the colonial period. The Diocese of Victoria have a shared legacy and responsibility to work together with First Nations people as we look towards the future. Along with some others here in the Synod, I traveled to Napier in New Zealand and attended the Anglican Indigenous Leadership Initiative, Wananga, in late September this year. This was an initiative of Tikanga Māori Archbishop Don Tamahiri. He has a vision of a new and ongoing wangana, or space of learning, where an indigenous Anglican worldview can be utilized to shape a new cohort of leadership across the unique regions and contexts of the Anglican communion. As he said, this is not a political exercise, nor a contestation for power within our communion. Instead, it will be an expression of motoranga, of indigenous ways of knowing and being that will bring unique and much needed solutions to highly complex problems, including climate, racism, poverty, and the ongoing challenges of colonization. Some of you will have participated in Canon Glenn Lockery's presentations on the voice referendum. I appreciate his willingness to participate in the community discussion on the voice referendum and for the encouragement of St. Oswald's Parish, Glen Iris, for this secondment to be made possible. I attended his presentation at the National Anglican Bishops' Conference in Hobart in March, and at the National Anglican Schools' Conference and met in Canberra in August. It's been a costly and demanding time for First Nations people during the period of this referendum debate. Let us keep this in our hearts and prayers throughout these days. And I suggest that whatever the outcome of the referendum, we pray the prayer for reconciliation in our worship on the Sunday following the referendum. The need to find a reconciled unity in this country remains pressing. I think that it is remarkable that even though our world and our lives have changed as a result of the COVID pandemic, we seem to have experienced a mind shift about it. The infections are still present amongst us. The virus continues to mutate and evolve. Deaths are still occurring because of COVID. But the focus on these things, the daily reporting of numbers and the sense of imminent doom seem to have disappeared from our public awareness. Our research community, including here in Melbourne, have made great contributions through their work and the work of their international colleagues to our well-being. In our diocese, we have accepted digital means of communication and meeting as fair enough equivalents of being present together in the one space. Parish clergy tell me how they are taking the regular online participants in worship into their pastoral planning, along with those who gather in church as regular members of their parishes. 
And I expect that this societal change of attitude must still be cold comfort for those who lost loved ones during the COVID pandemic, or still experience themselves the lasting effects of COVID infections. During the period of the COVID pandemic, I work with the bishops and other members of our diocesan leadership team to simplify the focus of the Strategic Directions 2017 to 2025 document. This resulted in the Vision and Directions 22 to 25 work that is represented in graphical form on the back cover of our order of service for tonight's Synod Eucharist. We took external advice about the pressures that the pandemic was likely to impose on us and recognized that there would be a long journey out of what became one of the longest periods of disruption that Australia, and particularly Melbourne, had experienced. This was all done with Paul's assertion of the focus of his ministry in Colossians 1.25 about making the Word of God fully known firmly in our sights. The four strategic directions parallel the wider structure of Colossians 1. I'd now like to reflect on some of the developments over this past year. As I commented last year, we are generally a more anxious society with this anxiety having a corporate as well as individual dimension. The continued conflict in Ukraine, along with Russian threats that tactical nuclear weapons could still be used in this war, deeply challenges concepts of human progress and safety. The Hamas invasion of southern Israel, the hostage taking, the enormous numbers of people killed on each side of this conflict are awfully confronting. In the past year, the language about the path to irreversible climate change has become more strident and urgent. Anxiety has not come to the forefront without cause. Assumptions about continual improvement in living standards, the next generation having it easier than the one before, are being challenged by the daily experience of many in Australia. Both conflict and structural inequality disrupt the sense of peace and fairness in the lives of those directly affected, as governments and agencies struggle to meet the increasing demands and expectations of the communities they are called to serve. And the diocese is not immune from these pressures, and navigating a purposeful and fruitful pathway requires all of our best endeavours. Under the Episcopal direction of Bishop Kate Proud, church planting canon Julianne Laird has provided capacity for church planting and canon John Sanderson has been engaged with church revitalization. In the last three years, there have been new church plants at varying stages of development, including at Merry Creek, Fairfield, Proclaim in Clyde North, City on a Hill, Whittington and City on a Hill, Surf Coast, Scent Collective, Glen Waverley, Reach West in Tarnit, with worship in English, Urdu and Hindi, Chinese Church Plant in Point Cook, Sojourners in Werribee, Grasslands, Carnley, a Persian Home Church in Deep Creek, an Arabic Church Plant in Geelong from Holy Trinity Coburg, the Emmanuel Iranian Church planting two new congregations, a Chinese congregation at Glen Waverley Anglican Church, Uni Congregation here at the Cathedral, and St. Peter's Jeng Congregation of Wyndham. Quite a lot. These initiatives represent commitment, vigor, and energy to proclaim the gospel. And people amongst us are leading and participating in these great renewing initiatives. And I'm very grateful for the generosity of the Benefact Trust, formerly the Old Churches Trust, the uh, English trust that's underneath the Church of England Insurance, which has provided the funding to stimulate some of these new ministry presences. And other funding partners have also generously played their part. Ten members of the diocese have engaged in church planting training provided by City to City in support of our church planting capacity building strategy. The Reimagining the Future team have engaged with ten parishes since April this year and are commencing engagement with nine additional parishes as I speak. It's envisaged further parishes will be able to connect with this resource in 2024. 
A second focus has been parish revitalization and leading your church into growth, or to use the acronym LISIG. The diocese has engaged with this program out of the United Kingdom, which is designed to help churches grow. The Leading Your Church in a Growth Conference was held in March earlier this year, ran over three days, and was attended by over 100 clergy and lay people representing 54 parishes. Congratulations if you are one of those parishes represented who took that initial step. The program sets church leadership up with a simple, achievable methodology to achieve missional growth in their local parish context. The LISIG Local Program supports parishes to renew their missional capacity, their planning in connection with the local community. 22 parish groups have engaged with this program since the conference. And there are a series of short videos available on the Synod portal where participating uh, members of churches talk about their journey and what has been achieved. And I encourage you to view these over Synod. There'll be another LISIG conference in 2024, held from the 27th to the 29th of February, where parish leaders can undertake a refresher program or acquire for the first time the methodology for application in their own congregations. And I'd like to acknowledge the support and work of the Reimagining the Future team and the engagement of the bishops, the archdeacons, the parishes involved and their leadership groups in this important initiative that positively impacts on our vision of making the Word of God fully known. The Working Group for Diocese and Parish Partnerships, chaired by Bishop Geneve Blackwell, has representatives from each of the Episcopates, along with Benitas, the Brotherhood of St. Lawrence, Anglicare Victoria, and the Melbourne Anglican Foundation. The Working Group provides a forum for information sharing and the identification of community service needs and social justice issues that specific Anglican agencies engage with and also to provide support through parish partnerships. The creation of a Memorandum of Understanding in 2022 with Anglicare Victoria has enabled parishes to engage in a range of programs and activities that seek to minister to people experiencing hardship as a result of homelessness, their refugee status, educational disadvantage and financial hardship. Support for people in prisons is provided under the Prison Chaplaincy MOU with Anglicare with a significant focus on youth detention and post-detention programs. Opportunity shops continue to provide valuable services and act as an important point of social connection with local communities. And I wish to acknowledge the dedication of Archdeacon Nick White, who has provided excellent leadership in the development of the Parish Partnerships Program and wish him well as he takes on his new responsibilities at St. Stephen's Richmond. One of the significant adjustments that parish made during COVID was to enable people to engage in prayer, Bible studies and worship online. This transformation of practice and method has broadened people's access to Christ and the Christian community in ways that many in church leadership had previously not considered. Our return to gathered worship has also seen the ongoing practice of online engagement in many church settings. This has allowed participation by people who are challenged by mobility or illness or who find their work commitments competing with service times. Diocesan communication channels have been increased to include Facebook and Instagram and to accommodate the growing engagement with social media and to ensure people can connect with the work of parishes, Anglican agencies, Anglican schools, and theological colleges. And I'm informed that the ADOM TikTok account is proving very popular with a Gen Z demographic and is a welcome point of engagement for our younger members and their friends. The bishops are also on board with midweek Bible verse reflection videos. The team at the Melbourne Anglican, or TMA, has shifted focus to accommodate a growing online audience in contrast to its previous focus on uh, only a print edition. The Everyday Saints podcast started in late 2022 and explored the Christian journeys of people connected to the church. To date, 11 episodes have been produced with a strong following. The vision for the Melbourne Anglican includes the provision of a modern and attractive communications platform 
that can support the church's message through growing the online community, flexible distribution strategies for printed editions, and comprehensive engagement with the mission and life of the Anglican Church in this diocese and beyond. There is a commitment by the diocesan office to streamline parish communications functions and to reduce the reliance on manual handling and to minimize email messaging and requests for information through our information and communications technology strategy. The email connect program which provides for the at melbourneanglican.org address has been adopted by 95% of parishes as the foundation element of their connectivity. This system greatly increases our email security and minimizes the opportunity of cyber attacks and data theft. Identity Connect is a second stage program where parishes are onboarded to Office 365 and the cloud for file storage and effective office administration. To date, several parishes have made this transition and I encourage you all to take advantage of this resource. Following Synod, a new Anglican Diocese of Melbourne portal will be operational to make access to documents more efficient. Compliance expectations which require effective reporting to regulatory authorities are driving significant changes to the way we manage data and monitor our organizational activity as a church. And I'm sure that the revised portal will be viewed positively by many in the diocese as we strive to uphold our social obligations and responsibilities. Enabling future capacity in ministry is the key focus for the Monomyth Episcopate. This portfolio has responsibility for formation and training of candidates for ordination, newly ordained clergy, and oversight of clergy well-being, professional supervision, and coaching programs. Bishop Brad Billings has been leading this portfolio for the past eight years, and in May 2023, the decision was made to exchange the roles of Bishop Kate Proud and Bishop Brad. Bishop Brad is now the Bishop for the Uthenong Episcopate and Bishop Kate the Bishop for the Monomyth Episcopate. And I'd like to recognize Bishop Brad's work in his book entitled Truly Called Vocation in the Anglican Church, recently published, which is an excellent resource for aspirants to ordained ministry. There are 43 people currently enrolled in the Year of Discernment program and 21 candidates for ordination. There have been two ordinations since the last synod, one in November 2022 where 19 people were ordained as priests and the second in February this year where 15 were ordained as deacons. There are currently 60 curates in the diocese. And I'd like to encourage and thank the fine work of both Ridley and Trinity Theological Colleges and the support they provide to students and ministry aspirants. We've achieved a lot in the last couple of years with a strong take up of the coaching and supervision programs led by Carol Clark. In 2023, the program has supported experienced priests, the newly ordained, authorized stipendary lay ministers, clergy in cross-cultural settings, youth and children's ministers, and people with a permission to officiate. The program has 61 coaches, 35 coach supervisors, and more than six, su six coach supervisor trainees and six qualified professional supervisors. There are currently over 180 participants engaged and plans are in place to expand the levels of engagement for the coming 2023-2024 year. The Reverend Stephen Delbridge is responsible for the rollout of professional supervision, one of the recommendations from the Royal Commission and a commitment for Anglicans nationally made at the General Synod in 2022. For our clergy to thrive and flourish, we must prioritize clergy well-being. Tim Dyer from John Mark Ministries, known to many in this diocese, has identified 10 things to help church leaders move from surviving to thriving, including learning and developing practical leadership skills, implementing a whole person self-care plan, embracing a Sabbath practice, building capacity for resilience, and pursuing ongoing spiritual formation. These are essential disciplines for maintaining well-being and longevity in ministry. 
Next year, there are plans to offer a series of seminars on clergy well-being, and Bishop Cade is working on continuing to develop a diocesan cultural well-being, along with the strategies to support this important area of focus. Building a culture which prioritizes care and reflective practice alongside strategic leadership enables the diocese to nurture and nourish enduring and productive leadership capacity in our parish and other settings. The meeting of Synod in 2022 recommended reconsideration of the 2023 budget with a view to bringing our expenditure in line with our income whilst preserving ministry as much as possible. This was taken seriously by Archbishop and Council and a working group was formed comprising members of the Council and directors of the Melbourne Anglican Diocesan Corporation to assist the work of Mr Chris Arnold who was engaged to review the budget and operations of the diocese generally to achieve a stronger financial outcome. This work took place over the summer vacation and I appreciate the work of all concerned to bring it to a conclusion in a timely manner for consideration at the February meeting of Archbishop and Council. 72 recommendations were made that ranged across the areas of financial management, governance and Anglican Centre operations. All 72 recommendations were accepted by the Archbishop and Council in February with the implementation of the recommendations reported to each successive meeting throughout the year. We have some of the outcomes of that work evident in the budget for 2024 to 2026 that has been approved by the Council and will be reported to the Synod, as well as the governance reforms contained in the Diocese and Governance Legislation Amendment Bill before us at the Synod. At the overview level, the two highest remunerated roles in the Diocese and Administration were removed from the organisation through redundancies. That of the Chief Executive Officer of the Melbourne Anglican Diocesan Corporation and the role of Chief Operating Officer. And I wish both Justin Lachelle and Matthew Wilson well as they make their new careers since leaving the Diocese of Melbourne and appreciate their work with us. There is no question that we have significantly reduced the resourcing and thus the capacity of our diocesan administration. And I'm deeply grateful for Malcolm Tadgell agreeing to incorporate the duties of the MADC Chief Executive Officer into his existing responsibilities as Registrar. His efforts have been considerable on behalf of us all. And there's been a reorganization of the administrative structures, including an outsourcing of strategic property advice. Significant decisions were made to reduce the support for media advice and chaplaincy. And I'm grateful for the assistance provided by Barney Zwartz as media advisor, and I wish him well for the future. The stipended role for the Anglican Centre chaplain was concluded a notice was given that the diocese's funding of hospital chaplaincy would also unfortunately conclude at the end of this year. Anglican Chaplaincy Ministry has been operating at Royal Melbourne Hospital since 1864. Both lay chaplains and clergy have ministered there and at other hospitals since. Countless thousands of people have been ministered to in their time of need over these many years. Frances Perry, wife of our first Bishop Charles Perry, was one of the founders of what is now the Royal Women's Hospital. This humanitarian work and Christian ministry has been a strong pillar of the work of the Diocese of Melbourne for a long time. In the 2022-2023 year, Anglican volunteers visited in our government hospitals 460 patients to offer prayer and pastoral support. Our stipended hospital chaplains, the equivalent of uh, 4.8 uh, full-time equivalent positions, recorded a little over 9,000 pastoral encounters, a remarkable impact that will not be possible in the same way after the end of this year. Government co-funding has always been small compared with our diocesan funding and is itself not certain to continue by the, beyond the end of this year as well. 
Now, this is all to say that I hope that the decision to cease diocesan funding is not the last word on this important ministry. And I am grateful for the continuing funding partnership. I am grateful for the continuing funding partnership with the Melbourne Anglican Foundation for continued hospital chaplaincy support. Our chaplains are vocationally called to this work and I know they feel a strong sense of grief at this time in the light of this budget decision. And I hope that some coordination of chaplaincy efforts can continue as it will be sorely needed to support the increasing demands that must inevitably fall to the parish clergy. I hope too that Christians will continue to find common cause in the important work of changing our culture to eliminate violence against women and other people who are overrepresented in experiencing harm. The efforts of our own diocese in developing the Prevention of Violence Against Women program is a good example of finding this common cause at a grassroots level to make an impact within our church community. My visits to Anglican schools this year, including at two student voice forums, were inspirational. Many young people and their families find their faith and their participation in Christian community and worship through our schools. They're a vital place for interaction for each new generation. And I'm grateful for the ministry of school chaplains in this work and acknowledge those chaplains who are present amongst us tonight. Our safe ministry work is important to our church culture and is a whole of church responsibility as we seek to ensure the church is a safe place for all. Victoria has adopted new child safe standards which align strongly with a consensus on child safe principles across the nation. It's been emphasized on many occasions that a culture of child safety is one of the most protective aspects that an organization can develop. And there is no part of our work where concerns for child safety can be absent. The harm to people who have survived child sexual abuse is very great and we need to be strenuous in our continuing efforts to ensure that this harm is avoided. This year has seen much activity in the area of safe ministry with the safe ministry reference group continuing to provide expert advice from across the diocese to the Archbishop and Council. The reference group's main focus has been safe ministry in relation to children and youth. In the past 12 months, the reference group has been preparing and rolling out the diocesan action plan to respond to 11 new child safe standards. It's been updating the diocesan safe ministry documents and continues to develop the diocesan management plan and updating the safe ministry training and developing junior safe ministry training videos. With the support of Anne Fairweather, the diocese's safe ministry and inclusion officer, people have engaged in safe ministry training programs in accordance with their role requirements. The safe ministry training resources launched in 2021 have been used by over 5,000 people, probably many of us tonight, clergy, lay staff members and volunteers who've each completed this training. Four diocesan presenters have been trained and are running sessions organized by the safe ministry team online, as well as when requested by individual parishes. Recently, the Commission for Children and Young People investigated a review of our systems for managing the protection of children and young people, and I expect that I'll receive their report later this year. And I cannot stress too much the importance of parish leadership, ensuring their local ministry has the appropriate systems and child safe information so that people engaged in youth children's ministry, we can confidently know have the required clearances and training credentials. And the Commission of Children and Young People has asked the diocese for an action plan and meeting these new child safe standards, along with a risk management plan. The templates for tracking parish progress can be found in the Safe Ministry Toolbox on the diocesan website. The risk management tool is still being walk, worked on by the Safe Ministry Reference Group and soon will be available. 
As a religious entity, we need to understand that CCYP possesses significant regulatory authority and powers and is able to interview, intervene in a number of ways if we fail to comply. Evidence of how we bring safe ministry into our daily operations and discussion is proof of how seriously we care about it. And I encourage all of you in parish leadership to include safe ministry and inclusion as agenda items on all your parish council meetings. Cura continues to act as the professional standards office and progresses all of our clearance applications, investigates complaints of misconduct, and works with parishes and authorized Anglican congregations to manage persons of concern, as well as being available to give advice to parishes and their uh, particular church authority in any matter. Thank you to all who exercise these safe ministry responsibilities in parishes and authorized Anglican congregations. Your diligent efforts and your commitment to ensuring the church is a safe place for children and vulnerable people to freely hear the message of Jesus is acknowledged and appreciated. I can again confirm that we've been able to meet our redress obligations without reaching into the funds of individual parishes and authorized Anglican congregations. Our approach in meeting these responsibilities from central funds contributes in part to the deficit operational budget that has been approved by Archbishop and Council. In the year under consideration, we have settled 11 matters for the National Redress Scheme, as well as 12 other matters arising from the Cura Independent Redress Scheme and civil litigation. A total of $5.2 million has been paid for redress in this period of one year. It is important that we continue to lament our past failures for victims of abuse as we implement the trauma-informed response to survivors that has been developed by Kiura. As I noted earlier in referring to the parish portal, information that may not have been required from parishes in the past is now necessary and is required in an accurate and timely manner. The information sought by our diocesan administration from parishes and authorized congregations for our external compliance reporting needs to be accurate and timely. We are experiencing a cultural change. Matters that were once unreported to the diocesan administration now need to be reported. Evidence of compliance across a range of our areas is now required as a result of these changed external regulatory requirements. Excellence in compliance and reporting in one context is completely undone if there is neglect or a casual attitude in another. The design of our processes aims to respect the responsibilities that are best exercised at the local level. Once again, all of this has an important cultural dimension and can only ever operate in an environment of commitment to the principles a willingness to apply them, and then an accountability for the outcomes. It's important that we pause at this synod to appreciate the people who formed the councils, committees, and boards of the 53rd Synod. They made a great contribution through a very challenging time. Some of them are subject to the sabbatical break requirements in their service, while others will continue to contribute, subject, of course, to your decisions in the ballot for membership of these bodies. And I sincerely thank all for their very generous contribution to the work of our diocesan governance. And I take this opportunity to inform the Synod that recently the Chancellor, Professor the Honorable Clyde Croft AMSC, informed me of his conclusion from the role of Chancellor. This was effective from the 30th of September, 2023. I'm very thankful for his service as Deputy Chancellor from 2007, as Chancellor since 2020, and as the Promatial Chancellor between 2014 and 2019. He's given very distinguished service to the diocese in this role, for which I am personally very grateful. An appointment of a Chancellor will be announced in due course, and I remain thankful for the wisdom of the Deputy Chancellor, Mr. Michael Dowling, who will be guiding me over the course of this synod. Finally, thank you all. And I single out my Episcopal team, Bishops Geneve, Paul, Brad, and Kate, 
along with the support we each have from those who work closely with us, particularly Executive Officer Ken Hutton, Registrar Malcolm Tadrill, and uh, General Manager Justin Lachelle for the time he was with us for all their efforts. You'll see over these next few days something of the work of the many others who give so generously of their time and talents in various governance roles within the diocese. I also appreciate and thank the senior staff team of Archdeacons, along with the Advocate and other honorary officers of our Synod. And I thank the Dean and the Cathedral team for the way they've so calmly responded with exceptional worship opportunities for the diocese and province and city over our 175th year that's now concluded. The list of functions and ministries in the diocese is very great, just as it is in the most vital place where ministry happens, amongst you in your places of worship at the grassroots. Thanks to you all in your own distinctive place of ministry and worship for what you do in parishes, authorized congregations, chaplaincies, and many other contexts. This is the vital work of the church as we seek to make the word of God fully known. May God's blessing be on you and prosper you as you carry out this work and on us all as we support and encourage it. And as I've encouraged you in the Sunday after our referendum, I conclude with a prayer for reconciliation from a prayer book for Australia. If you haven't found it, look on page 203. This was an enduring gift of the late Bishop Arthur Malcolm and his wife Colleen, who offered this for us to use in that prayer book. Lord God, bring us together as one, reconciled with you and reconciled with each other. You have made us in your likeness. You gave us your Son, Jesus Christ. He has given us forgiveness from sin. Lord God, bring us together as one, different in culture, but given new life in Jesus Christ, together as your body, your church, your people. Lord God, Bring us together as one, reconciled, healed, forgiven, sharing you with others as you have called us to do. In Jesus Christ, let us be together as one. Amen.